This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Hosted by Katie Milkman, an award-winning behavioral scientist and author of the best-selling book, How to Change, Choiceology is a show about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Hear true stories from Nobel laureates, authors, athletes, and more about why we do the things we do. Listen to Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. Our sponsor for this episode is Pilot.com, accountants specializing in small law firms. Pilot's use of full-time U.S.-based accountants take your firm's bookkeeping off your plate. And their fractional CFOs help you run a more efficient firm, increasing utilization and reducing revenue locked up in receivables. So if you're looking for a thought partner who can help make your firm more profitable, or if you just want someone to do the work right, check them out at pilot.com slash amicus. That's pilot.com slash amicus. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the Supreme Court. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. That's my beat here at the magazine. And this past week was a near frenzy of constitutional mayhem between a Supreme Court that had allowed Texas's SB4, that's the state immigration enforcement regime, to slip into operation and then back out of operation again. Donald Trump's staggering filing in his blanket immunity appeal that will be heard next month at the court. Former Justice Stephen Breyer's less than gentle takedown of originalism and also originalists in the pages of The New York Times. And Donald J. Trump's ever more apparent enthusiasm for criminals and lawbreakers as expressed in his presidential campaign. Hey, but good news. Starting Monday, Tish James can start to file liens on Donald Trump's property. Huzzah! Okay, you are bone tired. We get it. But we need to add one more log to the bonfire. And that is the court's hearing on Tuesday of a truly consequential medication abortion case, a case that never should have been brought, a district court opinion that never should have been written, and a bunch of plaintiffs that never should have been allowed to file suit, all of which will result in a full-on IKEA ready-to-assemble effort not only to put an end to the primary source of abortion care for millions of American women post dobs but also a case that threatens to take down the FDA's drug approval mechanism and big pharma and the modern practice of obstetric medicine all at the same time. So welcome to 2024. It's Margaret Atwood's world. We all just bear witness to it. Later on in the show, our Slate Plus listeners are going to get to catch up with Jeremy Stahl. He's our main Trump law correspondent with some updates on the half billion dollar price tag now dangling on Trump's prospective presidency and his race to post the bond before Tish James starts stripping the gold plated toilets for parts. Monday is also D-Day for Trump in Judge Juan Mershon's New York courtroom, where the fate of his hush money criminal trial will be decided. If you are not a Slate Plus member, but you'd like to hear extra segments like my conversations with Mark Stern and with Jeremy Stahl and our emergency episodes, please do think about joining this extremely elite rarefied club of warriors and nerds. You can subscribe now to listen on Apple Podcasts by clicking Try Free at the top of our show page, or you can visit slate.com forward slash amicus plus to get access wherever you listen. And to our Slate Plus subscribers, you are the best, seriously the best. Thank you. But first, this week, we preview the most important abortion case to follow from the high court's reversal of Roe v. Wade back in the 2021 term. Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine versus FDA was filed against the FDA and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services by a conservative legal group on behalf of some anti-abortion doctors in a jurisdiction in which, oh, lucky ducks, they could only possibly draw one judge 
judge, Matthew Kaczmarek, who had devoted his entire prejudicial career to pushing extreme right wing fringe conservative ideas into the mainstream. Their claim was that the FDA approval process for mifepristone, one of the two medication abortion drugs, was haphazard and slapdash and that the FDA illegally accelerated approval of mifepristone in the 1990s and then loosened restrictions on it in 2016, again in 2021, without any regard for its deep profound dangerousness. Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine also argued that the FDA's 2021 decision to allow telemedicine abortion and the mailing of abortion pills violates a dead letter 19th century anti-vice law called the Comstock Act. And undergirding all of this is their claim that the plaintiffs in this case had standing to bring this litigation on the basis of extremely strong feelings and very wobbly facts, but we'll get there in a minute. Last April, Judge Kaczmarek issued a decision invalidating the FDA approval of mifepristone outright nationwide because, well, as I said, fake facts, strong feelings. The Fifth Circuit cut back some of the craziest parts of Kaczmarek's decision but left some of it in place. The Supreme Court is going to hear all of this on Tuesday. And the case is limited to two questions. One, whether the plaintiffs have standing and whether the FDA did something bad in approving Mifepristone. To help us understand the stakes and the scope of the stakes of this appeal, we are so happy to be joined this week by Carrie Ann Baker. She's got a JD and a PhD. She is the Sylvia Bauman Professor of American Studies and the chair of the Program for the Study of Women and Gender at Smith College. She's also a contributing editor at Ms. Magazine, and her upcoming book, Abortion Pills, U.S. History and Politics, will be published by Amherst College Press in December. Carrie, welcome to the show. Holy cow, I have a lot of questions for you. Dahlia, great to be here. So this case has been styled, unfortunately, as just a straight up abortion case, a kind of natural outgrowth of the reversal of Dobbs from two terms ago. But it's actually really, in very specific ways, an abortion pills case. It's a case that sweeps in decades of how the FDA does licensing, the biotech and big pharma industries. What do we do about interstate mails and the ways in which reproductive medicine and telemedicine have changed how pregnant people behave since Dobbs? And all of this starts, I think, with this pitched battle to establish, expand, and maintain legal access to abortion pills in the United States over decades. So I would love for you to just set the table for us, Carrie, by helping me understand how this is different from the kind of surgical abortion fight we were having leading into Dobbs and how this is kind of a consequence of Dobbs, but also a very different conversation. Abortion pills are today 63% of the way that people access abortion health care in the country, and it's probably much higher. Just a few days ago, the Guttmacher Institute released a study showing that the number of abortions in 2023 topped 1 million, which is more than the last 10 years The last time it was over a million was 2012. And a major reason why abortion access has increased despite Dobbs is because of two things, abortion pills being more accessible and telemedicine, people being able to access abortion pills through telemedicine. That happened recently. It happened in 2020 and 2021 as a result of COVID. As everybody began to access healthcare through telemedicine, advocates uh, filed a lawsuit to force the FDA to allow people to get abortion pills through telemedicine. Historically, they had not been able to do that. And so people living in rural areas, people even living in states where there are abortion bans, now are able to access abortion pills through telemedicine from doctors in states that still allow abortion health care. So abortion pills are really the present and the future of abortion, and that's why they're being targeted in this case. The anti-abortion movement is very aware that abortion pills are the crux to controlling women's access to abortion or people's access to abortion, and so they're going after it. 
And just to be really clear, you read those new Guttmacher numbers um, showing that actually the number of abortions are ticking up. And I guess the headline of that was that 63 yes. percent of those abortions. Right? We used to say when this uh, Mifepristone case was filed, we were like, oh, about 50 percent of abortions were using pills. That number's ticking up, too. That's an increase from, I guess, 54 percent yes. in 2020. So I think your point is this is not a moment in which Dobbs ends abortion in America. America, it changes how people access it, who accesses it. And this is an attempt to sort of stave off that shift by an anti-abortion movement who'd been pretty laser focused in a lot of ways on doing away with surgical abortion. Absolutely. They were laser focused on Roe, which overturning Roe did impact access to abortion pills because in states that have banned abortion, people can no longer get abortion pills from local doctors. But what they didn't anticipate was telemedicine. And, you know, now we have doctors in states like Massachusetts and New York and California who are serving patients in states with bans. Six states passed telemedicine abortion provider shield laws that allow them to do that. And so about 12,000 people living in the 14 states with bans are now getting abortion pills through these providers in the six states with telemedicine abortion shield laws. Now, I will say those numbers from Guttmacher didn't include those patients. So the the 63%, it's much higher, actually, because those 12,000 pills a month being sent to people were not included in that number. And so, yes, absolutely, this is the future of abortion care. And so that if they can get the Supreme Court to ban the pill outright and prohibit all doctors from prescribing and mailing abortion pills, then it really clamps down on access to people people around the country. You know, obviously, if they ban it outright, that also clamps access. I will note, though, that there's a robust underground abortion pill network that a decision by the Supreme Court will not be able to shut down. So I think the thrust of what you've written in your book and and in some of your recent um, pieces in Ms. is that Anybody who thinks that the Mifepristone case kind of emerges fully formed in the wake of Dobbs actually wasn't paying attention because there has been a decades-long effort by pro-life advocates to churn up doubt Mm -hmm. and uncertainty about abortion pills, their efficacy, their safety, and that actually this has both set the United States way behind the rest of the world. Uh, Long before Dobbs, all of this quote-unquote medical uncertainty and the dangers and the sort of chumming up the debate with fake facts and fake claims, this is a decades-long proposition. And so just for comparison, in France, uh, Mifepristone was developed there in the 1980s. It was approved in 1988, Uh, This is not the path taken in the United States. And I think your point is anyone who's now looking at this debate and sort of saying, huh, this is these are alarming (laughs) studies. This, you know, maybe this was an irregular process at the FDA doesn't understand that the point was to have an irregular process at the FDA. So as you mentioned, France approved the abortion pill in 1988. And when we talk about the abortion pill, we're talking about mifepristone, which is the first medication taken in a two-medication process for medication abortion. The second pill is misoprostol. Mifepristone interferes with um, the the hormone progesterone, which sustains a pregnancy. And then 24 to 48 hours later, you take misoprostol, which is a commonly available ulcer medication that causes contractions and expels the pregnancy tissue. So mifepristone was developed in 1980 in France, and the French government approved it in 1988. American anti-abortion activists were over in France trying to interfere with that process and trying to prevent the company Roussel Uclaf from bringing the medication to market. And they used many of the techniques that we're familiar with today and, and for the last several decades in the United States, which is terrorizing the executives at the corporation and the medical researchers who were developing the drug. 
calling them, standing outside their offices, screaming at them, calling their family members, terrorizing them at their homes. And it didn't work. They, the drug was approved, but then the U.S. abortion movement turned to the U.S. and tried to block it from being approved by the FDA, the U.S. FDA. And they used all these same techniques. And they also targeted the activists who were trying to get it approved and the pharmaceutical companies that might try to get it approved. So through the anti-abortion work, they prevented Roussel Uclaf from trying to gain approval for the pill in the United States. They also dissuaded any mainstream pharmaceutical company from taking on Mifepristone and trying to get it approved. So eventually what happened is a organization called the Population Council, which was a nonprofit organization that worked on access to contraception around the world, took on the medication and took on the process of doing the clinical trials and getting applying to the FDA for approval that company also, the Population Council also had to find a distributor for the medication. And so basically, a group of private investors created a company called Danko and applied to the FDA to get it approved, got it approved, and then found a manufacturer. And all of that process was was fraught because of anti-abortion interference. So it took over 12 years after France approved to get it approved in the U.S. And the FDA was terrified. The FDA officials were very nervous because they too were being targeted. And I've interviewed for my book a lot of the activists that were involved in the process. And it was a very irregular process, not because it was done quickly or in any sort of slipshod way. They had belts and suspenders. They were very nervous. They were, they knew they were had a target on their back and they were being not only targeted by anti-abortion activists, but by anti-abortion members of Congress who were threatening their funding and threatening, you know, they were under a microscope. So they were very careful throughout the process of approving the drug. And the lawsuit filed in the Supreme Court case says, oh, this was done too quickly. It was fast-tracked. They didn't have adequate evidence. They had voluminous evidence at the time. And in fact, when the FDA approved the drug, they put in place very unusual and medically unnecessary restrictions on medication abortion. For instance, they required that doctors register with a drug manufacturer. They prohibited pharmacies from dispensing the drug. Normally, when a drug is approved, the doctor prescribes it and a pharmacy dispenses it. But what the FDA required in the case of mifepristone is that the doctors themselves order the drug, store the drug, label the drug, and dispense the drug in person to the patients. It's highly irregular that that kind of thing happens. It happens you know, only with really super dangerous drugs. Mifepristone is not a super dangerous drug. It's actually safer than Tylenol. It actually should be over the counter. We know that now. They didn't know that back then. But the the people at the FDA were very concerned about, you know, they wanted it to go smoothly. They didn't want any complications. So the people at the FDA were not actually hostile to the abortion pill, but they wanted it to, They again, they had belts and suspenders. They wanted to make sure that there were no problems. And then they were like, yeah, and then in a few years, we'll remove some of these restrictions. Well, the problem is then, you know, Bush got elected in 2000, the same year that the Mifepristone was approved. And of course, once Bush was in power, he was not going to allow the FDA to loosen the restrictions. So it wasn't until 16 years later that eventually the FDA began to loosen some of these restrictions under the Obama administration. We're going to take a short break now to hear from some of our great sponsors. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate Cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity, revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. 
We're going to pause now to hear from some of our great sponsors on this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Rocket Money. Have you always struggled with finding time to manage your finances? At the end of a busy week, the last thing you want to do is spend time budgeting all of your expenses or tracking down customer service teams to cancel subscriptions you no longer use. But Rocket Money does all that for you. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, you have full control over your subscriptions and a clear view of your expenses. You can see all of your subscriptions in one place. And if you see something you don't want, Rocket Money can help you cancel it with a few taps. All you have to do is submit a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. They'll deal with customer service for you. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash amicus. That's rocketmoney.com slash amicus. Rocketmoney.com slash amicus. Let's return to my conversation with Carrie Ann Baker about the history and future of medication abortion. I just think this is such a sort of scales falling from the eyes moment, because if you come into this conversation in Judge Kaczmarek's courtroom, the FDA's behavior is hard to explain, right? It looks wildly overregulated with these sort of mincing steps away from overregulation that's still overregulation. And what you're saying is you're the FDA and you're under attack from day one by a concerted, and I think you're saying, you know, quite menacing and financially costly effort to make you practice defensive regulation. This is the necessary result. I want to I want to get back to the the meds themselves, but I also think we have to talk for a minute Carrie about standing because that is a threshold issue in this case in order to sue in federal court. The Constitution says that plaintiffs have to establish a concrete and particularized injury that is actual or imminent. The providers who brought this case say that they are, I'm trying to be fair, they are injured by the existence of mifepristone because they may someday, as physicians, have to treat some person who's been prescribed it by another physician, suffered some horrific consequences, and then ambled into their office for treatment. And under this theory of standing, I I could certainly bring a case against what? Dental floss? It it does- Yes. It's really um, such a capacious theory of standing. It presumably would allow any physician to walk into a court anywhere in the country and demand that the FDA withdraw what? Approval of the COVID vaccine? Yes. So I I would love if you could just explain for us why this case could just be kicked away on standing because under any construction of what standing requires, this is a fanciful, fanciful argument. Their standing argument is entirely speculative. First of all, mifepristone has been prescribed to over 5 million people since it was approved in 2000. And, you know, the anti-abortion movement says, oh, it's so dangerous. And, oh, women are going into the emergency room all the time. They're not. They're absolutely not. This medication, as I said before, is safer than Tylenol. There have been over 100 peer-reviewed studies showing the safety of this medication. It should be over the counter, as I said before, but it's because of anti-abortion pressure that it's not. So uh, the standing argument, as you said, is that somebody will take this medication and end up in an emergency room and that one of these anti-abortion doctors will happen to be in the emergency room and be forced to care for this patient. Now, first of all, there are conscience exceptions around abortion in most states. And so nobody has to do anything with regard to abortion to serve a patient. But second of all, it's so rare that somebody would end up in an emergency room and Even if they did, it's usually 
they don't need much. They just need an extra dose of misoprostol. They don't need, and, and sometimes they might need a procedural abortion, but those doctors aren't going to have to do it. And if you look at the way they articulate their potential harm, it's literally that they would be offended by the fact that somebody would be having an abortion. That's not concrete harm to them. They, you know, it's not their business, quite frankly. Women can get treated by, their, you know, somebody else. They're not going to go to them. So I think their standing argument is the weakest part of the, st- of the case. I mean, I think the entire case is weak, but the standing is the threshold issue. And that's where I hang my hope is that the Supreme Court will dismiss the case on standing and not get to the merits. But it's it's really, I mean, I've said this before, if they sustain this case, any person could bring a case, could judge shop, find a judge that's favorable to their point of view and challenge a drug and have that drug removed from the market nationwide. And this is terrorizing the drug in- industry. They're very concerned about this because they invest millions of dollars to get drugs approved. And if this is the way a drug could be removed from the market. It's going to completely destabilize the pharmaceutical industry. Just to shore up what you just said about the feelings ball nature of the injury here, I just want to quote Judge James Ho of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals writing in the opinion uh, that upholds a big piece of Judge Kaczmarek's order and He literally writes the sentence. This is a separate opinion. He literally makes the claim that, quote, unborn babies are a source of profound joy for those who view them. Expectant parents eagerly share ultrasound photos with loved ones. Friends and family cheer at the sight of an unborn child. Doctors delight in working with their unborn patients and experience an aesthetic injury when they are aborted, right? That language of aesthetic injury, as though this is some kind of national show-and-tell project or national, you know, art exhibit, this has absolutely nothing to do with material harms. And the idea that we're having a conversation about how parents feel when they show other people their ultrasound images is really, I think, to highlight how much this is removed from a conversation about reproductive justice, economic equality, all the things that the Dobbs dissenters said were at the sort of beating heart of this conversation. And now it's a judge on the Fifth Circuit making claims about aesthetics. Well, and the irony is abortion pills are used in the first 12 weeks, and there's actually nothing to see. In the first 12, I mean, maybe at 12 weeks, something itsy bitsy, but certainly in the first nine weeks, you can't see a, a, a baby. There isn't a baby there. You can't even hardly, you, you know, you can see fetal tissue, but there's nothing to see. I mean, the ways in which they sort of imagine that at four weeks or six weeks or even 10 weeks that there's a intact baby, there's not. I mean, they're literally, this is their imagination. I I want you to pull a little bit on something you started to say about all of the studies, all of the extensive studies that Judge Matthew Kaczmarek had to ignore in order to make the, you know, determination that he did about how dangerous mifepristone is. And, And as you noted, and this is so important, Carrie, you know, there's 150 studies that establish that mifepristone is safe. He was citing, what, anonymous blog posts from anti-abortion websites. And then, and this is the turn that I think a lot of us missed, he just started citing really shockingly bad science. And uh, a few weeks ago, for listeners who missed it, one of the medical publishers had to, that was cited extensively in the opinion in this case, had to pull not one, but three different articles as junk, I would love for you to talk about this as somebody who has studied the science of abortion pills for so long. This is the thin edge of the wedge pulling these three pieces. How did we get to a place in which bad science is churned up and peer-reviewed by the same groups who are actually <laughs> litigating the case itself? And then that becomes sort of the last word on where medical science is. Kasmerik's 
um, cited a study that has since been withdrawn by the peer-reviewed journal that published it. There were also two other papers that have been cited in the briefs before the Supreme Court that were also retracted. These studies had data analysis errors. They had unsupported assumptions. There were fundamental problems with the study design and methodology. There were unjustified or incorrect factual assumptions, material errors in the author's analysis of the data and misleading presentations of the data. And so how did they get peer reviewed? I mean, they were published by Sage, which is an academic publisher. How did they get through peer review? Well, first of all, the authors did not reveal their conflict of interest. They were with anti-abortion organizations and the people that peer reviewed them were anti-abortion activists. And so the journals, I think, are really overwhelmed by the process of peer reviewing. And these slipped through the cracks and got approved. And so when they ended up getting cited in Kazmierich's decision, people looked more closely at these studies and they realized how flawed they were. They contacted the journal and said, this is not good science. This is not rigorous science. And so the journal ended up withdrawing it. But I think Academic publishers are under a lot of pressure. The same kind of targeting that is ha- happened to the FDA back in the day is happening to these academic publishers. And after they were withdrawn, the you know anti-abortion movement said, "This is censorship. You know, you're you're censoring our free speech, and you're you know you're biased because you're withdrawing our studies and not withdrawing their studies." And so they're doing this kind of double standard that you see happening in politics today. But we're talking about science. Science isn't a political thing. I mean, I I do think politics can influence science, but the study's good or it's bad. It's, it's, it's rigorous or it's not rigorous. And I think that what happened with this journal is that they let this slip through. And once people went back and looked at it, the journal withdrew the pieces. So I feel like we're now on a long journey about um, fake facts and bad science, but there's one more station before we get to the FDA, and that is the group that brings this case, Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, which remarkably (laughs) sets up shop right down the street from Judge Kaczmarek's courthouse. Uh, It has no discernible presence otherwise in the state of Texas. It just feels like one of those kind of like Tom and Jerry cartoons where you just import what looks like a serious operation into the back door of a courthouse where you're only going to draw one judge. And I think this is yet another, you know, we've talked so much on this show about fake facts, fake plaintiffs, you know, kind of concocted, uh, not real organizations and shops that bring cases. And this feels like it's of a piece with your answer to my prior question, but it really gives you the sense that just as you can buy a fake study now and bring it all the way to the Supreme Court, you can buy a judicial district and you can buy some plaintiffs. Yep. And a decision, quite frankly. I mean, if you look at Kazmierich's decision, it looks like an anti-abortion screed. He uses the words unborn child tons of times, and he makes arguments that feel like they're directly out of anti-abortion advocacy. It's not judicial. It doesn't feel, I mean, if you read the decision, it doesn't feel like a normal judicial decision. It feels very slippery and very polemical and yeah, you know, as a lawyer, it's frustrating to read because it's like, did this guy go to law school? Does he know what a legal opinion is? It feels, you, you mentioned fake studies. It feels like a fake decision. Um, and the oral arguments before the Fifth Circuit were similarly very frustrating to listen to as a lawyer. And then the decision issued by the Fifth Circuit, particularly Judge Ho's concurrence, but the whole process. You know, I mean, Josh Hawley's wife argued the case before the Fifth Circuit. The judges were very friendly to her and extremely hostile to the Department of Justice attorney. It felt so personal. At one point, one of the judges on the Fifth Circuit asked the Department of Justice's attorney to apologize for an argument she made in her brief. It it was the most surreal oral arguments that I've heard. And so, I, I, yeah, it, it, the court is captured. 
the court is captured, and I'm talking about those lower courts and the Fifth Circuit. I fear, you know, that the Supreme Court also, you know, it's like they set everything up. They set up the science. They set up this fake organization. They set up the courts, you know, through Trump appointments of these judges. Kaczmarek was an anti-abortion activist before he got appointed to the court. He was a lawyer that filed the kind of suits that then were filed before him. He wasn't neutral. He wasn't unbiased. They really set the whole thing up from the beginning. I think that probably leads us inexorably (laughs) to Comstock. I can't believe, you know, you've just talked about how Judge Kaczmarek's opinion is not rooted in science and not rooted in law, as you and I understand it. And then he goes one further uh, because (laughs) he wants to cite the Comstock Act, which dovetails with so much of the sort of anti-freedom, pro-white Christian family, anti-birth control, anti-divorce program that we're now seeing set forth by Project 2025 enthusiasts and people, as you say, that are sitting in Congress trying to bring us back to some imaginary 1950s white family. And I guess my first question is, let's just talk briefly about the Comstock Act, uh, because this is a thing that Judge Kaczmarek's willing to hang his hat on. This is an 1873 anti-vice, anti-birth control act, purports to ban, quote, every article or thing designed, adapted, or intended for producing abortion or for any indecent or immoral use for being mailed, Absolutely. So Anthony Comstock was part of the anti-vice campaign in the 19th century, and he was behind the passage of this law. It was an anti-obscenity act, and it was that they were very uncomfortable. You know, it was around the time of the development of photography, and of course, as soon as there was photography, there were naked pictures, and Anthony Comstock did not like that, and he wanted to try to prevent immorality and, you know, basically sex outside of procreative sex within marriage. And so he was behind the passage of this bill, and then he became the U.S. Postal Inspector. And so he got to rifle through everybody's mail and try to find naked pictures and try to find references to birth control or, you know, other things. So it is really astounding that in the 21st century that the anti-abortion movement is trying to revive a 19th century anti-obscenity act to prohibit mailing abortion pills. And I want to add, it would not only prohibit mailing abortion pills, it would prohibit mailing anything related to abortion, including instruments used in procedural abortions, including written information about abortion. And it would apply not only to the U.S. Postal Service, it could apply to any sort of interstate mailing of pamphlets or books discussing abortion. It is an act that developed before we had a First Amendment that applied to the states. It was an act before we had, you know, the civil rights that we have today, the interpretation of the 14th Amendment and the freedoms that we take for granted today. Griswold in 1965 established the right to contraception. So this is a really bizarre thing to try to revive the Comstock Act to ban abortion nationwide. And that's what they're trying to do. And, you know, it's very anachronistic. And I think it's, it is just inaccurate. The law, the way they're trying to interpret the law is inaccurate. And the Department of Justice has said that. They issued an opinion early on after this case was filed. The U.S. Postal Service asked the Attorney General whether they could continue to send abortion pills through the mail uh, uh, under the Comstock Act, and the Attorney General issued opinion and said, yes, this does not violate the Comstock Act. But of course, they're trying to get the Supreme Court to rule otherwise. I just want to point out one thing that you said that I think is important, which is massive amounts of current First Amendment doctrine, as we understand it, was reaction to the Comstock Act, right? I mean, the freedoms to put yes. things in the mm-hmm. mail, the freedoms to, uh, you know, what we think of as obscenity and pornography and, you know, all evolves from this ridiculous puritanical desire to paw through other people's mail. And so it's not just, and this is so important, and it's the move I think we miss because we sort of laugh about Comstock and we 
laugh about Judge Ho referencing Comstock, like that's never going to happen. But it's a move that really does align perfectly with the mission here, which is A, return us to this puritanical age. But B, this is no longer a question per Dobbs that gets resolved by the states. This is a national question once you start invoking Comstock. It would prohibit mailing abortion pills in New York State in Massachusetts, in California. This is what people need to realize, that this is going to impact people nationwide, potentially, if the Supreme Court were to interpret Comstock to prohibit mailing anything related to abortion or abortifacients, then it would impact all of us. Let's pause now for a short break. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Choiceology is a show all about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Each episode shares the latest research in behavioral science and dives into questions like, can we learn to make smarter decisions? Or what is the power of negative thinking? The show is hosted by Katie Milkman. She's an award-winning behavioral scientist, professor at the Wharton School, and author of the best-selling book, How to Change. In each episode, Katie talks to authors, athletes, Nobel laureates, and more about why we make irrational choices and how we can make better ones. Choiceology is out now. Listen and subscribe at schwab.com slash podcast or find it wherever you listen. This episode of Amicus is sponsored by 5-4, Dissecting Supreme Court Tightly Split Decisions, a new book by former Justice Frank Sullivan and Indiana University McKinney Law School professor Nicholas Georgiakopoulos. After stepping down from the Indiana Supreme Court, Justice Frank Sullivan and fellow Indiana University McKinney Law School professor Nicholas Georgiakopoulos embarked on an eight-year collaboration that culminated in this brand new book. Now, to the joy of Supreme Court watchers everywhere, you can order 5-4 Dissecting Supreme Court Tightly Split Decisions from Amazon. Sullivan and Georgiakopoulos explore these decisions from fresh angles and cover topics like changing majority coalitions, red scare decisions, super dissenters, and more. The book even includes fold-out posters that visualize historic swing votes and lay out summaries of decisions issued by each side. This is a treasure trove for court watchers. Geek your heart out with 5-4 Dissecting Supreme Court Tightly Split Decisions by Georgiakopoulos and Sullivan, Order from Amazon for delivery, 5-4 by Georgiakopoulos and Sullivan. You're listening to this podcast, so you care about history and what a period we're living through right now, specifically when it comes to the situation in Israel and Gaza. Right now, you're hearing a lot of loud voices screaming about genocide, massacre, and occupation. But these words, slogans, and various headlines are not enough to help understand what is happening over there. And that's where this podcast comes in. Check out Unpacking Israeli History. Catch up on previous seasons and enjoy new episodes from season six each week where they cover many of the topics that are relevant to what's going on in Israel today. From the history of infamous terror groups Hamas and Hezbollah to the story of Nakba to Israel's disengagement from Gaza in 2005, there's so much to uncover. Unpacking Israeli history cuts through the noise and helps you understand Israel's present through understanding Israel's history. So educate yourself. Learn the history behind the headlines. Find Unpacking Israeli History wherever you listen to podcasts. Back now to my conversation with Carrie Baker about the history and the future of abortion pills. So this week, I can't believe I'm saying the words Marjorie Taylor Greene in this podcast, but there's a first time for everything. This week, Marjorie Taylor Greene said at a pro-life symposium, quote, we will repeal the FACE Act if we get the opportunity. And that's a reference to the 1994 law that was intended to protect 
abortion providers, healthcare providers, and patients from the kinds of intimidation and violence that they were experiencing just walking into a clinic. And I should note that Representative Chip Roy of Texas has authored legislation that would repeal the FACE Act. He has 39 co-sponsors, the Senate's companion bill, which is authored by Senator Mike Lee of Utah, signed on by Josh Hawley, has five uh, co-sponsors. And I just want to be really clear that the Justice Department's list of pro-life activists who they worry about include people who throw Molotov cocktails and concrete bricks into clinics, who block access to clinics and harass clinics, and mass shootings. So this is a serious protection. And I want to go back to what you said at the very beginning, which is so much of the playbook in the anti-abortion movement was about surgical abortions and clinics and kind of terrorizing and intimidating people seeking access to a clinic. Medication abortion is the workaround. It's you can't right protest someone's mailbox yet, I guess. And I think it's so important because this was your initial point, which is that this movement that is born in terrorizing people, in shouting them down, in flooding them with you know monetary and physical threats, kind of has no footing in the medication abortion context, unless they are able to do the thing they're trying to do in this case. If doctors can prescribe abortion pills by telemedicine and send them by mail, then the central tactic of the anti-abortion movement, which is to basically restrict abortion to identifiable limited number of clinics and then terrorize those clinics, that strategy is undermined. They really are very frustrated by the fact that people don't have to physically go to clinics anymore and cross protest lines, often multiple times in order to get abortion pills or procedural abortion. You know, their, their strategy all along has been to restrict the number of locations where people can get abortion and then target those locations with, by blocking access, and that was what led to the FACE Act, or by terrorizing doctors, following doctors home, protesting in front of doctors' houses. If the doctors can't be identified because they don't have a brick-and-mortar clinic, if they're located, you know, in a location where they don't know where they are, I mean, these telemedicine providers are entirely virtual. They don't have brick-and-mortar clinics. All they have is a website. And, you know, they might go after the website, but they can't often locate the doctors. They can't locate the patients. They can't scream to the patients, oh, you're murdering your baby or whatever. And that fundamentally undermines their strategy. Also, you know, their strategy has been to close down clinics. You know, you bomb a clinic, you bankrupt a clinic. And so we know that at the time um, of Roe, that there were many more clinics than there are today. The number of clinics has shrunk significantly. Another major strategy of the anti-abortion movement is to create fake clinics, crisis pregnancy centers that look like clinics. They're often next door to clinics. And they try to divert patients going to get care by pretending to be the clinic the patient is going to. And then once the patient gets in there, they bombard them with misinformation about abortion, that it causes cancer, that it causes infertility, that it causes depression, none of which was true all of which has been disproven by leading medical authorities in the vast majority of research. And so by, by tr you know, having the ability to be able to mail abortion pills to people, their central strategy is undermined. And so I think that's why they've invested so much in this lawsuit and in the effort to go after abortion pills, even though it's a real stretch what they're arguing, that the FDA didn't have enough evidence or that, you know, that abortion pills are dangerous. It's completely fictional, but I think really that is their only strategy. And in a way, it's it's the indignity. It's all about stigmatizing abortion and making people feel like it's unsafe. And that's what the anti-abortion movement has done so well. Really, they're they're fighting for the law, but they're also fighting for our hearts and minds. They want to try to make us feel that abortion is wrong, that it's dangerous, and that it's immoral. I mean, and and so by filing this lawsuit and getting headlines, you know, that, oh, abortion pills are dangerous. But I think it's happening. Having an unintended consequence. Before Dobbs, only about 15% of the population even knew what abortion pills are. And now, 
Many people know what abortion pills are because it's in the headlines all the time. They're seeing that, um, oh, there's a medication you can take. And, and the fact of the matter is all the research shows that people really like them. They don't want to lay on a table with their feet in stirrups, particularly if they're survivors of violence, right? And we know that, you know, 25 to 30 percent of women are survivors of sexual violence. They don't want to have to go in. They'd rather be at home, take a pill, do it in the privacy of their home with their friends nearby, you know, watching a television program. I mean, so many people prefer abortion pills. But again, people need options. They, it needs to all be legal and it needs to all be accessible. Once the um, FDA allowed pharmacies to distribute the medication, which, you know, at first it was mail order pharmacies, Honeybee Health and American mail order pharmacy. But now CVS and Walgreens is now distributing. It means that your average doctor can now prescribe abortion like your GP. You know, the person you've been going to your whole life, your pediatrician, let's say you're 16 and you get pregnant, your pediatrician can prescribe you abortion pills without having to stock them themselves. And then you can get it through the mail or you can get it at a local pharmacy. And so it means that more doctors can provide abortion. They don't have to be abortion doctors in clinics. It can be family care providers. And there's a whole movement trying to get family care providers to provide abortion. Um, not just pills, but also um, manual vacuum aspiration, but pills in particular because it's so easy. And also do not only doctors, but nurses and physicians ass assistants can also prescribe abortion pills. So it's, it's creating more access. And that's what the anti-abortion movement wants to stop. Carrie, this is such an Overton window case because we've just had a conversation about Comstock and about not putting pills in the mail and about repealing an FDA regime that has existed for decades. But of course, the court could just do some middle thing, which is what the Fifth Circuit essentially did, which is go back to unnecessary roadblocks. But can you just tell us, I mean, I think I just want to position it as this is where you started. You could get this over the counter in a sane world. This is not all these regulations were onerous and unnecessary at the time. They're onerous and unnecessary now with provable data. But I would love for you to just talk through if the court takes some middle way and says that some of those later efforts by the FDA to pull back on restrictions, we could still have material harms to people who are seeking medication abortions. To me, there is no middle ground. If they ban telemedicine abortion by enforcing the Comstock order, then you know, the the number of abortions will drop precipitously in this country. Well, I should say abortions through the formal medical system. As I said before, people will get pills now. You can order pills online for $25 and have them in your mailbox within days. It, it, there's, because of Dobbs, there is a robust underground pill movement that has made pills more affordable than ever. But I will say, if the court tries to supposedly do a middle ground. It, the, the key is that that 2021 decision to allow telemedicine, that is what is increasing access to abortion, both for people in states with bans, but also for people in states with legal abortion. Because even in states with legal abortion, clinics tend to be focused in urban areas. And so people in rural areas have a hard time getting there, particularly low-income people. We know that half of people that get abortions live in poverty. 75% of people who get abortions are low-income. When you have to travel to an abortion clinic, it costs $550 to $700. If you can order pills by telemedicine, you can get them for $150 on a sliding scale. You can get them for free. A lot of providers are working with abortion funds to provide abortion pills to people for free if they can't afford it. And I mean, these are mission-driven providers, but, uh, you know, the barriers are financial, they're travel. Keep in mind, these are low-income people. So when you have to travel, not only are there the costs of travel, but there's the costs of childcare. 
the majority of people getting abortions already have children. They work low-wage jobs where they can't just take multiple days off. People, if they have to travel long distances, you know, they might have to have lodging. In some states that have waiting periods, you have to stay overnight. It becomes a ban on abortion. And this is why, with telemedicine, why the numbers are going up so much. Because not only are people traveling from states with bans, it's people in states where abortion is legal are getting more access. Like in Finland, 95% of abortion is done with pills in the first 12 weeks. And the fact that we have, you know, and 93% of abortions are done in the first 12 weeks here. The fact that we have such a large number of um, p- abortions later in pregnancy has to do with all the barriers that are put in the way of people accessing abortion. And so it pushes them into the second trimester and sometimes even into later than that because of having to raise the money. The, and then the later in, uh, uh, in a pregnancy you are, the more expensive it is. It's $700 in the first trimester, but it's, but it's over a thousand in the second trimester. And then it can be in the third trimester up to $10,000, right? If you're doing something for like a fetal anomaly. But I don't think there's a middle path. I mean, obviously, if the Supreme Court were to completely remove Mifepristone from the market, that would be the most extreme reaction. But if they ban telemedicine, then Access to abortion is severely restricted through the formal medical system throughout the United States. And it will be devastating to hundreds of thousands of women and people who can become pregnant each year. So I I think that my hope is that they will dismiss the suit on standing. I don't think that will make it go away forever. I think that, you know, already in the lower courts, and you know this, three attorney generals have intervened, and Kazmierich has granted that intervention. And, you know, the hope is that for them is that these attorney generals will have stronger standing than these random doctors. I, You know, I think the standing argument is still weak for the attorneys general, but I don't think this is going to go away even if the court dismisses this suit on standing, because this is too important to the anti-abortion movement. Carrie, I think you've probably landed us exactly at the paradox of this case. And so I think my last question to you is, to the extent that there's some glimmer of hope that the court isn't willing to go to the extremes that Judge Kaczmarek or even the Fifth Circuit was willing to go, the, the, the sort of punchline is that's because there's this is a big money industry, big money, big medicine, big pharma, right? This is ostensibly the thing that ended up saving Obamacare at the Supreme Court. There are big biopharm heavyweights who are warning not just about, you know, what it means if mifepristone is, is removed from the market, but that meddling in the FDA approval process is going to result in huge blows to the clinical development of drug approval, to, uh, you know, uh, science itself, to how you could possibly, you know, invest in drug development. I mean, this is the pharmaceutical industry in its own weird way might be the thing that allows the Supreme Court to say, we have to press pause because money talks. Absolutely. You know, it's sad that the court has been captured by billionaires. And, you know, it's that's obviously very frustrating from a democracy point of view. But I do think with regard to this case, the pharmaceutical industry has filed briefs uh, at all levels in this case and said, do not do this. This will bankrupt us. This will completely destabilize the pharmaceutical industry. Pharmaceutical companies are not going to invest millions of dollars to put drugs on the market if it could be pulled off the market. And so I I think that that is my, the, the hope that I have is that the court will not do this. Now, of course, there's always what we call abortion exceptionalism. They'll find a way to do this by saying, oh, well, the Comstock law, it doesn't apply generally to the pharmaceutical industry. It just applies to this particular drug. And so, you know, I think I think that for them to question the scientific decisions of the FDA would be destabilizing to the pharmaceutical industry. For them to rule that the Comstock law applies here so that the FDA approval of telemedicine abortion is not appropriate, that's different. So that, to me, is one way that they could sort of thread the needle and appease the pharmaceutical industry, but still prohibit 
mailing of abortion pills and telemedicine abortion. So that worries me a lot. But um, the pharmaceutical industry has come out in force. There, I think there were two briefs before the Supreme Court, one by the trade association representing pharmaceutical companies and one signed on by a lot of pharmaceutical executives and people in the pharmaceutical industry. And they are very opposed to the idea of reopening FDA decisions. And I think we need to keep in mind the FDA, the court has never removed a drug from the market on the grounds that the FDA had bad science or made a a bad scientific decision. And that's why it makes me think that they may say, well, they didn't know about the law. They didn't know about the Comstock law. So they said this could be mailed. Um, That's not a scientific decision. So that, that does worry me. Carrie Ann Baker is the Sylvia Delugash Bauman Professor of American Studies and the chair of the Program for the Study of Women and Gender at Smith College. She is also a contributing editor at Ms. Magazine, and you should read her work there. Her upcoming book is called Abortion Pills, U.S. History and Politics. It will be published by Amherst College Press in December. Carrie, this has been such an invaluable and really crystal clear discussion of what the stakes are next week. I cannot thank you enough, both for your work and for giving us your great big brain on a week when we really needed to separate heat from light in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Dahlia. Great to be here. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you all so much for listening in. Thank you so much for your letters and your thoughts and your questions. You can always keep in touch with us at amicus at slate.com, or you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Sara Burningham is Amicus's senior producer. Our producer is Patrick Fort. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. Susan Matthews is Slate's executive editor, and Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We'll be back with another episode of Amicus next week. Until then, hang on in there. Join us today during the Jeep Celebration event. Right now, get 20% below MSRP for an average of 15178 under MSRP on the purchase of a 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe or Summit 4xe. Not compatible with lease offers or with any other consumer and set of offers. 15178 average based on 20% below average MSRP from all 2023 Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe and Summit 4xe models in dealer stock. Residency restrictions apply. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 4-1. Jeep is a registered trademark.